What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is my good friend, Grant Williams. Grant is the host of the Grant Williams podcast and the author of the Things That Make You Go Hmm newsletter, which I'm an enthusiastic subscriber to and which you can find at grant-williams.com. This was one of my favorite conversations ever on the podcast. I feel like this is becoming a trend. I had the same feeling after my conversation with Russell Napier. I don't know if it has something to do with the way that I'm approaching these episodes or if there's something about the times that we're living in and the things that are at stake that make them feel so meaningful and important. I think it's the latter. I think what makes them feel so consequential is that we're grappling with what will turn out to be the greatest socioeconomic and political upheaval in a hundred years. And the questions that I've been asking myself during this time that have most preoccupied me are what does this mean for the future of democracy? What does it mean for civil society and for the viability of capitalism? And how do the answers to those questions inform how I should position myself as a sovereign citizen in anticipation of the changes that are currently underway? Those questions and our answers to them are at the heart of today's conversation. Before we start, I want to encourage all of you who value these types of discussions to share the podcast with your coworkers, friends, and family. I don't rely on sponsors or advertisers, so the second part of our episodes are available to premium subscribers only who make the production of this podcast possible. You can access those entire conversations as well as the transcripts and intelligence reports to each episode by visiting our website at hiddenforces.io, selecting the episode that you're interested in, and clicking on the premium extras, where you can then sign up to one of our premium content tiers. Since some of this episode deals with markets and investing, it should be absolutely clear that nothing we say on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guest are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, I hope you all enjoy this deeply informative and meaningful conversation with my good friend, Grant Williams. Grant, welcome back to Hidden Forces. Mate, it's always a pleasure and an honor to get invited, so thanks for having me. And it's great having you on, man. Uh, how you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. I've been busy as hell for the last few months, as I'm sure you have. There's, there's so many things to talk about and think about and write about. It's kind of crazy right now, but you know, it's good. I mean, it'd be, I'd hate to have the situation be the opposite with nothing to think about and nothing to talk about or write about. That would be a disaster. Yeah, you've been uh, you've been really busy lately in, in point of fact. I mean, not just doing your usual newsletters and podcasts and speaking gigs and traveling, but also putting out new podcasts. I know you have one recently that you're planning to launch, I think, with Luke, and you launched another one with Doomberg. So you've been pretty prolific. Yeah, look, there's, I just think there's, um, you know, I, the big idea of my podcast was just to to talk to interesting people, right? And I think over the course of that, partnerships and collaborations have emerged, you know, with with Fleck on the end game and with Steph on the Super Trip Happy Hour and Ben Hunt with the narrative game. And it's, I just think for the listeners, it's great to have two different perspectives and two different people coming at a particular subject and, and trying to kind of pick it apart. And, um, you know, I think what we've seen happen post Russia's invasion of Ukraine, particularly on the financial side, you know, those sanctions against the, the central bank, to me, and look, time will tell if it's right or wrong, but to me, that was the starting pistol for for some really, potentially really important changes. And there are plenty of people out there that think it's nonsense and I'm, I'm open to those ideas. But you know, when I look at it, and I look at what's been happening in the world over the last 10 years, kind of quietly, so I understand why people aren't paying attention to it, the, the Russia sanctions, sorry, post-Ukraine, say to me that it's going to accelerate something that's been very quietly taking place in the background. So that's what I wanted to cover with Luke. And then, you know, a mutual friend, Doomberg and I, you know, we're both passionate about helping other creators of content to try and reach an audience, you know, and, and, and there's a whole world of people out there doing really interesting things with great perspectives and great insights. And it's tough to find an audience, you know, Twitter's a, a noisy place. So if I can use my platform to help other people 
build businesses and, and reach an audience and you know gain awareness of what they're talking about. I'm well, you know me. I'm always happy to do that, and it's it's been a lot of fun trying to help these people, you know, create something. You know, so you the beginning of your answer directly addressed the question that I had in my mind, which was, how have the recent events in Ukraine possibly accelerated or changed your underlying assumptions about? what is going on in the world, or if they've just accelerated the state of criticality of the system. That's the question I want to ask you, but I do want to put a pin in this thing about helping content creators, because I'm really curious to understand what criteria you look for when you do that. But sure. yeah, go ahead and, and tell me how you feel the events in Ukraine have accelerated your thinking. Well, look, it's such a fascinating thing, right? Because it, it was happening right in front of us all. All this stuff was building up to the border and everyone had their opinions about the likelihood of Putin going over that border. And most people handicapped it the wrong way. Most people thought he wouldn't either, he wouldn't either take that step or he wouldn't need to. You know, cooler heads would prevail and diplomacy would, would win out and there would be concessions and he'd back down and it would all be fine. And I, and I think that speaks to the world that we've kind of grown up in these last number of years, you know, certainly near to us. In, in the Middle East, obviously, there's been all kinds of conflict, but. In Europe and in the US, we haven't seen that. And we've come so close to crisis so many times. And every time, right, something has been done to make the crisis go away, whether it's the multiple times Europe seemed to be falling apart or the multiple times the US seemed on the verge of some catastrophe. And, and there's always been a solution, often at the 11th hour, but the solution has been found. And I, and I think that's conditioned us to assume the bad things won't happen. And your governments, Western governments, have gone out of their way for decades now to make their primary mission to stop as many bad things happening to as many people as possible, right? That, and, the, and the reaction to COVID was a perfect example of that. It's, there's something bad happening. Let's not take any chances with anybody. Let's just shut everybody up and not let people decide for themselves the level of risk they want to take. We are going to, you know, everyone was saying, stay safe. Right, stay safe was the catchword when when COVID first came out there, and and this idea of being safe is something that we've all either gotten used to or had kind of foisted upon us. It, it, look, frankly, in a world, it's impossible to make everybody safe. We all know that, but there's this desire to live in a safe world, and we've kind of abdicated responsibility for our safety to to the people who make the bigger decisions, right, on the political stage. And so I think when Putin did cross that border, I think it was a huge wake-up call for a lot of people, me included. You know, I, I looked at the situation and thought, you know, he doesn't need to. He's got Europe by the balls with the gas pipelines. He's a much stronger geopolitical operator than the Boris Johnsons and the Justin Trudeaus and the Joe Bidens and the Scott Morrisons of the world. He doesn't need to go across that border. He, he can probably get what he wants by negotiating and, and threatening. But what I didn't really account for was the fact that for whatever reason, and, and perhaps we, you and I can kick around what those reasons might be, there was no negotiating with Putin. You know, I think when I look at it, there's been this long time belief that's kind of grown post-World War II and the, and the kind of American obsession with communism. And that has developed into an obsession with Russia. And that has developed into an obsession with Putin. And so it's almost the we will not negotiate with terrorists strategy, right? Putin is kind of treated like a terrorist. He's not treated like a world leader. He's treated like a terrorist and there's no negotiating with him. And as I said at the very beginning of this, I wrote a piece on Putin the man back in November. And I said at the time, look, let's put aside thoughts about Putin the man, right? Because anyone that's had the career he's had and has moved from the KGB to the president of the country in a handful of years, he knows where some bodies are buried, right? We can all just put that aside and agree on it. We can all agree that he's not a nice guy. We can all agree that he's ruthless and all those things on a personal level. But as a statesman and a leader of one of the largest country in the world by landmass and arguably one of the three or four most important nations on the world, certainly on the nuclear stage, here's a guy who frankly deserves to have his voice heard. Now, whether anyone makes any concessions to him or not, is is up for debate. We don't know how those conversations went down, but it certainly seemed to me that no one was listening to him. No one was listening to his demands, which in some ways were pretty straightforward. You know, I, I don't want NATO on my borders, which I get. I mean, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis because 
the Americans didn't want Russia 90 miles away, right? So, you know, there was a moment in time where this could have been, I suspect, negotiated and de-escalated. Now, that's not to say Putin may have moved the goalposts every time we were getting close because he wanted to fight. We, we'll never know. But we never entertained any of his demands. You know, he drew a red line the same way Obama drew a red line, right? He didn't do anything that no other leaders haven't done. But for some reason, a red line from Putin means something different to a red line when Obama lays it down. So for whatever the reasons, you know, we've ended up in this situation where Putin either was always going to go across that border or he felt slighted and felt he had to go across the border. Again, we won't know. But now we're in that world. And, and that world has changed so many things. It's extraordinary. It's changed things in the financial world. It's changed things in the real world. It's changed supply chains. It's changed commodities. It's changed everything. And I think that it's a catalyst for a change that's been coming for some time, this kind of shift away from deflation back to inflation. And this has been a huge accelerant to that. And you know, I think people perhaps at the margin don't quite grasp just how much the world has changed in the last few months. And it, look, it predates Putin to a degree, but it's gotten noticeably more dramatic since he went across that border. And with that, I'm going to shut up and let you talk because I don't want to monopolize the whole conversation. No, I thought that was great. I enjoy that actually, because you're usually the person that's always interviewing. You rarely get to talk. So this is actually a great opportunity. This is something that I think about quite a bit. And when I say this is how we got here. You know, I've done like so many episodes on trying to understand yeah. that. There's no perfect starting date, but I think like a good place to start is oftentimes at the beginning of the end of the Cold War and or, or just the end of the Cold War. And I'm curious, though, to ask you what you think led us to this place where relations between the U.S. and the post-Soviet Union, the Russian Federation, went increasingly off the rails to the point now where Russia has made this, I think, I would call it a catastrophe strategically, actually, that has put now Russia in the position of being a subservient partner to China. And this is obviously not a situation that Putin would want to be in. And in, in many ways, you could imagine that Russia would have found a more natural orientation towards the West. I mean, Russia has always historically been torn between East and West. Its identity has always been its own. It doesn't fall easily into either category of the Eurasian continent. But I think that it could have easily oriented or more easily oriented westward, but it didn't. And I'm curious why you think that is. No, I think it's a great point. But you know, if we do go back to the end of the Second World War, you know, this, as I said earlier, this American obsession with communism as a bad force has remained. I mean, it remained through Joe McCarthy's time, and there's been this inherent suspicion about communist countries ever since. Uh, you know, and on one level, I get it. And on another level, I really, really don't. And I think you know, we spent a lot of time in the 80s trying to de-escalate the Cold War, trying to bring Russia into the fold. And you know, I think when the wall came down, there was this kind of brief moment in time where there was kind of a, a welcoming of Russia back into the, the global marketplace, if you like. And then opportunity, I think, was lost. You know, I, I think there was a point in that time where we could have helped Russia. We could have done a lot more to kind of integrate them back into the world. But instead, there was kind of victory laps being done by the US and the allies. Um, you know, th there were a lot of victory laps being done about how communist had been, uh, communism had been defeated. And we went from Yeltsin, who was always a fragile leader, to Putin. And you know we've we've went from a fragile leader who needed his handholding, a much more single-minded leader who absolutely didn't want his handheld. And and if you look at, I mean, there's been plenty written about this and Putin's obsession with Peter the Great, and you know how he was always going to do this because he wants to reclaim the Russia that was once great, and those borders are far further west than they are currently. And Peter Zion's done some fantastic stuff talking about the choke points that Russia wants and perhaps needs to gain control of to, in order to stop being invaded. But realistically, in the world we live in today, you know, I think these ideas that someone's going to invade Russia is kind of foolish. I mean, there's no one on their borders that's going to invade them. You know, The Turks are no longer the force they were. 
Chinese, maybe, but they're they're trying to expand the wrong border if that's their worry. So it's really difficult for me to understand, Dimitri, but, but I feel like there was a moment in time when the Cold War ended that instead of embracing Russia, they were still seen, maybe not as a threat, but they were still seen to be acting the wrong way. They didn't want to become a democracy. They wanted to kind of keep this communist idea, but kind of fold capitalism into it. And that just didn't seem to be enough. And, you know, I think there is a portion of the blame for this that has to be laid at the feet of the West, that has to be laid with a kind of non-conciliatory means of ostracizing Russia from the global community. Now, a lot of that, as I said, is Putin and the, and the problems that the West have with Putin the man rather than Russia the country. But if you have a leader like Putin and you make him the enemy, it's just not a very smart long-term tactic, as you can see with the results. So I don't know. I, I Like you, I trace it back to the end of the Second World War. But for me, it was more there, there was a time when the wall came down, there was an opportunity there. And I think it, it was missed in all the victory laps that are getting taken over the, the victory against communism. All right. So let's try and dissect that. First of all, let's talk a little bit about communism, because you said on the one part, it's obvious why you get it. And the other side, you don't get it. So I assume on the on the obvious front, at least let me tell you how I see it. I think that American elites have always been inherently against communism before the Second World War because it threatened their power base. Like they were worried about revolution. They were worried about an ideological communist revolution spreading from the Soviet Union to the rest of the world. So that kind of makes sense to me. I'm curious what you mean by you don't get it. Are you extending communism to something else? Because obviously the Russian Federation isn't communist. And that actually goes to the second question that I have. But why don't you just work on that one for now? No, look, look, I think you're right. Look, at the end of the day, I think it's fairly self-evident that communism ultimately doesn't work, right? So the, the problem is if you leave communism alone, ultimately it will fail. You know, the, the Chinese are kind of the last man standing on that of any meaningful size. And of course, that isn't pure communism anymore. They've had to embrace certain capitalist it's, ideals. It's a fascist certain, model. Right. It's not a communist model. Right. So you know, we, yeah. we've had this obsession with communism when, you know, what's the old saying? Never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. You know, we, we could have left the communist societies to themselves and ultimately they would have failed. But there's just been this, as you say, the American power base, communism does not work for Americans. But I, the one thing I could never understand is why were they so worried about it? You know, why are Americans so fixated with communism? It's not as though it's ever going to take hold in America. And we, you know, we, and we hear people talking recently, in, you know, in, in recent memory about, you know, that Obama being a socialist and all this, you know, Bernie Sanders of the world and the AOCs of the world. But, you know, socialism is not going to take hold in America. I, I, I understand why they're guarding against it and they're guarded against it. But this fear of communism, I've just never understood it. You know, it's not something that Britain fears. It's not something that Canada fears or Australia fears. It's only Americans that have this singular obsession with communism. And as I've said, you know, I understand it from the perspective that it's never a bad thing when you're a superpower to have an enemy, even if it's just an enemy ideal that you can turn up and turn down as and when you need a bad guy. But, you know, I'm at a loss to understand why communism is seen and has been seen through the annals of history as such a big threat to the West. Well, let's talk about that a second, because, again, like this is something that I've thought quite a, a bit about, because I also have this general framing that you put forward around the West's role in the deterioration of the relationship between Russia and the United States. But if you look at what happened after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we opened ourselves to China. We bent over backwards to make that relationship work. And they were communist. We didn't do that with Russia. And they were fiercely capitalist, or at least they were claiming to be, they were trying to be. And I said earlier that China is fascist. That's also not entirely correct and not entirely true. And it's also all of these things exist on a continuum, which is why it's so difficult to have a conversation about it. But clearly, if any of those two countries were communist, it was China because they didn't have a revolution in China. They had one in, in the Soviet Union. So how do you explain that? Well, don't forget, when we when we embraced China, and I take that back to 2000, the WTO, right? That was the embracing of China. It was, China wasn't the China of today, don't forget. It was a big country. It was a potential big market. 
but it was a very poor country. It, it had an enormous amount of poverty. They weren't seen as a threat in the way the Russians had been through the Cold War, with their nuclear weapons being right on the border of Europe, and obviously post-62 and the Cuban Missile Crisis, where, where they were making aggressive moves. So there's been this this fear of Russia and this belief that Russia is an enemy power. You know, what's interesting is as China has embraced its association with the West and grown and become stronger and become more assertive on the world stage, well, look what's happening now. You know, now there's an awful lot of people in the West looking, saying, geez, look what we've built. This, we've created a monster here. We need to now make China the enemy. We need to demonize China. And it may be too late for that. You know, that cat may be well and truly out of the bag now, and, and there's no going back from that other than, once again, to create distance between the two countries. It's really difficult. And, that you know, your point about Russia is well made. You know, at the end of the Cold War, we should have embraced it. They embraced the West to a degree. But again, the way that Russia was broken up and sold off in the wake of the wall coming down to the oligarchs, at the time, it was very clear to see what was going on. You know, it was very clear to see the country was being looted before our eyes. But did we do anything about it then? No, there wasn't really anything to do about it. It was right. an internal Russian issue. And everybody kind of stood back and let it happen and, and watched all that take place. You know, then Putin comes to power and, look, by all accounts, makes a deal with the oligarchs and says a variation of, you can keep your money, but... 50% of it belongs to me. And that deal worked in everybody's favor. Was anything done about it then? No, nothing was done about it then. What was there to do? But the same way China has got more powerful and more assertive, you know, Putin has become more powerful, not necessarily more assertive, but he's become a bigger threat in that he's very quietly gone ahead and basically supplied all the gas to Europe and got Europe completely dependent upon him. And suddenly he is a threat because he's got his foot on the energy supplies of Europe. And, you know, at what point has Putin changed? I would argue he's the same guy now he was when he took office in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? He's the same guy. They all knew he was an ex-KGB spook who'd gotten the top job in the country through whatever means. He'd held on to power. He'd rewritten constitutions. He'd done everything to stay in power. Why is he suddenly a bad guy now, right? You have to be realistic about this and look back and say there have been plenty of times where the West has looked the other way and done business with Russia, particularly in around energy, where it's been in their best interests. But what concessions have been made to Russia? You know, that whole time people have been buying gas with with kind of while well, holding their nose, but still sending billions of dollars to fund Putin because they needed the energy. Now here we are in a situation where you know he's starting to say, well, you know what? Here's what I want. Here's what I believe to be fair, and in Russia's best interests. And no one would pick up the phone and answer his call. Even you know Macron went there for a few photo ops, but you know he's, I don't view him as a serious politician. Uh, I don't view any of the leaders in the West as serious politicians, frankly. And so here we are. You know he goes across that border, and and look, I I think his calculus, looking at the timeline of what happened after he went over the border. If you remember, the very first thing that the West didn't do was cut him out of SWIFT. You know, that was that was the big stick that we all knew would be really painful that was kicking him out of SWIFT and the energy pipelines. And we didn't do that. We said, we, no, we're not going to do that yet. It's you know, And the backlash was so severe from people, they were kind of almost forced into it. And then, you know, then we get the Russian central bank sanctions. And look, when I saw that, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that because, that, that, as I say, that's something that I believe changes an awful lot of things. When I saw that action, I was like, whoa, you know, that seems a really big thing to do now, to just start with that, because you don't really leave yourself anywhere to go if you do that. And, and I, I looked at it and I thought, it just seemed really strange to me. And subsequently, I've had conversations with a mutual friend of ours who I won't name because we had this conversation in private and I don't, I don't want to talked about, about who said this, but someone who has friends at the Fed who told me that he'd been told that he heard from people in the Fed, the first thing they knew about this was when this sanction got announced. You know, it was done in Treasury. It was a, an economic advisor, Dilip Patel, that came up with the idea. And so, you know, I'm back to thinking they've made a knee-jerk reaction. And I've talked about this recently before with other people, so excuse me for if I'm repeating myself, but... I keep going back to Mario Draghi and whatever it takes. You know, here's a guy 
who says three words and single-handedly saves the euro from, at that point, people forget in 2012, it was an almost certain implosion. The euro and the potentially the eurozone and Draghi comes out and says, we'll do whatever it takes and believe me, it'll be enough. And we all kind of stood back and said, wow, you know, this is ECB are serious and it stopped people challenging that. And then you fast forward a few years when it's kind of a distant memory for people. And Tim Geithner in his account of the crisis says, Draghi told me he wrote those three words on a napkin before he went out and gave the speech. And so I think there's an awful lot of things that are happening that are reactive and people are being faced with the situation. They're making snap judgments because everything now lives in the short news cycle and everything is judged in social media and you have to be seen to be doing something immediately. You can't be thoughtful anymore. You can't say, you know what, let's look, okay, Putin's gone across the border. We need to think about the appropriate steps to take. You can't do that, right? Everyone is screaming at you, do something. And as this friend of mine said to me, you know, he said, we, we have to do something. This is something, so let's do it. And that feels like what they did. And this sanctioning of the central bank, you know, as I've said before, if you are a central bank that holds dollar reserves and you are not thinking through plans to diversify away from holding as many dollars as you do, frankly, you're derelict in your duty right now because America has demonstrated that if they deem you to be a bad actor and Again, let's go back to what I said earlier. Putin has been deemed a bad actor for many, many years. He's now done something that they've decided is crossing the line. So bang, all your reserves, they're worthless. What do you do if you're Saudi at this point? What do you do if you're Saudi and you hold all those dollar reserves? You've had the Khashoggi incident. You've had all that happen. You know that America is withdrawing from the Middle East. You know that they're retrenching. Um, you know that there's a chance that you are going to be left to fend for yourself at some point. And now you've seen them do this to Russia's reserves. I would think if I'm MBS, I'm sitting there going, you know, the, after Khashoggi, the bar that I have to hurdle to be deemed a bad actor by the US has probably been lowered, not hired. Um, and so what happens if they I do something in Yemen and they suddenly wake up and decide that Yemen's important, which it hasn't been, right, for the longest time. No one's been talking about Yemen. What if that's important one day? Um, for whatever reasons, you know, again, someone running for office in the US decides to make Yemen a thing and people get behind it on social media and people start agitating for something to be done in Yemen. Well, if I'm MBS, I don't want my dollar reserves sitting at the behest of a foreign central bank who can literally make them worthless overnight. You know, and you would argue, well, what about all the Saudi oil? Well, I'd say the same with Russia and the natural gas. So we're in a very, very different geopolitical world right now um, post this. And I think the kind of dominoes that have fallen have kind of fallen quietly. But for the people that had a certain corner of this domino maze to watch and have seen the ones fall near them, they have to be looking at the situation and deciding what, if anything, they need to do about it, not just now, but going forward. Yeah, so a lot to unpack there. I want to go all the way to the, to the beginning and revisit the original question around what happened and why Russia was treated one way and China was treated a different way. I have come to the view that this was largely a result of the forces of interest group politics. Not just private interests, but also in the case of Europe, a great example is NATO. There was yep. no similar institution on the Asian continent. And so after the end of the Cold War, NATO was still around. And well, what was it supposed to do other than expand? and find in additionally extraterritorial missions to engage in. So, I mean, when I've reflected on it all, I kind of wonder, not necessarily if it was inevitable, obviously it wasn't, but just how difficult it was for the ship of state and the administration, these administrations really, over the course of these many years, to pivot and adjust their policies. When in fact, we never actually achieved, I don't think, a sort of public consensus view on what America's role in the world should be after the end of the Cold War and what it meant to be a unipolar power. In fact, in my view, the only fact of the post-Cold War era was its unipolarity. Everything else came and went. You know, the world that Bush Sr. put forward in his New World Order speech looked different than the world that Clinton was shaping, though still it had this vague commitment to human rights and principles of freedom and capitalism. I mean, that's the other thing. 
it lacked the ideological uh, war or battle that characterized the Cold War. And it relied on this idea that the goal for the future of the world is to increase living standards. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that was appealing. That doesn't appeal to something that's, I think, psycho-spiritual within us. And that's for a whole other conversation, and I'm not even qualified to have it. And I'm sure people have thought about it, but it deserves, I think, much more attention relative to some of the other forces that drove the let's say, the disintegration of the unipolar moment. And then Bush 43 comes along. And unipolarity looked very different under Bush 43 than it did under Bush 41. And I think that what they had set up that world to look like, this idea that America would be this benign global hegemon, to what it became under Bush, which was this muscular, jingoistic power engaging in wars of choice that were so obviously imperial in their logic, but which relied on hypocritical moral rhetoric, which was so easily exposed to be false. And that is a box that America has put itself into where today so many of the criticisms orbit American hypocrisy. You know what I mean? And that is a conversation that you can't win because the reality is that America has done and American intelligence agencies and the White House over the years have done so many things from assassinating elected leaders of state to overthrowing democracies. And I think part of the problem is that you have a case like, let's say, the um, you know overthrowing uh, Mossadegh's administration in 53. The way that so many people see that, again, they put it into this moral framework. And because they lack the larger context of the Cold War, the security concerns, the need to source oil from the Middle East, all of those dynamics, without taking those into account, you look at that and you say, oh, this is just the imperial American aggressor just trying to dominate a brown, resource-rich, you know, like whatever country. Yeah. And that's not actually accurate. It's much more complicated than that. But anyway, that kind of speaks to my point about, uh, I guess, well, speaks to something that maybe we'll get into, which is the, the the difficulty of having these conversations in the world we live in. Let me just ask you. Let me ask you. Yeah. You know, I, I've done this exercise a few times, and it's quite an interesting one. But you know, when, when we talk about America, right? What is America? I think I think we have each of us in our heads and our hearts has an idea of what America is, or was, or stands for, or stood for. But it changes. But what it is in effect is different periods with different leaders in charge at different times, right? It, it comes down to the leader of that country. And more and more, the kind of thread of America, as we kind of tend to think of it, has been whipsawed between different leaders. You know, I, I look at 9-11, I look at the financial crisis, I look at the, the conflict with China, I look at Ukraine, and I think to myself, okay, what if you switch around who was president at that time? What if you put Obama in the White House on 9-11? What if you put Bush 43 in the White House a month ago when Russia went across the border? What if you put Clinton in the White House when Putin was trying to agitate for concessions? You know, and I, and I think you can see very quickly that at all of those major turning points in the last 20, 30, 40 years, right? If you had a different guy in the White House, we would be living in a very, very different world e either way. And it could have gone in either direction. But America, I don't want to say it doesn't exist anymore, but I think that shining city on the hill, to use the, that kind of tired old phrase, is something we look back on post-war. We look at a period when America was becoming a great country after World War II, having kind of I'm a Brit, so I can never say the one who won the Second World War, but they certainly came in at the right time and helped the guys in the White Hats win. But we have this kind of misty, rose-colored view of America. And yet more and more, and it's, look, it's the same with Britain. It's the same with you know the Margaret Thatchers and John Majors and David Camerons. And it's the same with the different leaders, the Tony Blairs, right? Tony Blair, we had a different leader in power when Tony Blair was. Who knows what the world would look like? And so- these countries have become hostage to politicians who have their own agendas, who have their own strengths, their own weaknesses, and oftentimes tested in ways that they're not really fit to cope with. 
you know, and we've seen that happen left and right. We've seen it happen every time something happens. Now, in the middle of all this, go back 20 plus years and there's Putin on his own. He's the one constant, right? He's the one constant in all this. Or you could say Xi Jinping, but for the purpose of this conversation, Putin has been a constant the entire way through. So different leaders have had to deal with him with their own insecurities and their own you know, weak points and their own things that they disagree with, they agree with, whether they're presence of reproachment, whether they're presence of confrontation. You know, Trump got absolutely pilloried for having what one would call a diplomatic relationship with Russia, right? He wasn't demonizing the guy. And in fact, everyone came out and said he's pro-Russia and the Russians have put him in the White House and all that. It used to be called politics, right? It used to be called having a relationship with the other big nuclear power on, on the planet. But everything, and, you, and you've done more work talking about this than most people talking about identity politics and, and how that works. And so, you know, it's really difficult going back to your original point when you talk about America. You know, I feel personally that I, I know what that used to be, but I really don't think I understand what America is anymore. I think it is far more insular in that the number of domestic problems in America is increasing, and that's taking its eye and its focus off the external problems that it has been responsible for for the world for the last 50 years, right? It's been the world's policemen, everyone calls them, they have been. But the extra stress and the extra strain at home has taken eyes off foreign policy and it's concentrated on domestic policy. And, you know, people say in, in a war between global politics and domestic politics, domestic politics always win because that's what gets you elected. So it's a long rambling answer. I'm not sure there's even a coherent thought in there, but these are just things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And I just, it just struck me when you said, when you talked about America, and I, as I say, I struggle to wrap my head around what that is today. Actually, it was great because there's, we're going to just roll through you know, like this yeah. is just, we're just going to keep rolling and keep rolling. Cause I think the more we talk, the more we start to uncover what we're trying to get at. As far as presidents, it's a really interesting observation because the obvious one that came to mind for me, who could have been elected president and would have been dramatically different than his opponent was John McCain. Right. And yet Great I point. think that even if John McCain were elected, yes, the world would look very different, but John McCain wanted to double down on what was a failed policy, the failed policy of his predecessor. And so when I look back, I think there are only two presidents that I can think of conclusively, and I'm leaving aside everyone before Lyndon Johnson because I just don't know enough to make any comments. But I think the best would have been George W. Bush Sr. Mm -hmm. I think the way that he handled the end of the Cold War, I agree. you know, famously he said uh, that he didn't want to go dance on the wall, on the Berlin Wall. He was very careful about not insulting the Soviet leadership. He was a humble man by his nature. And I think that that served him well as a leader during such a precarious time. I also think Nixon would have come up close second as a president that would have done well because the Nixon administration really took an approach of realpolitik. And that was, of course, strongly influenced by, by Kissinger, but Nixon and Kissinger were partners in power, to quote Robert Dalek, who were so aligned on foreign policy. And of course, Nixon opened China. He was a pragmatist. And I think that that is a big piece that's been missing. America, in the years that we're describing here, became very hubristic. And yeah. that, that hubris is obvious in the way that they talked about people they didn't like. And, and the president of Russia is the best example of it. The moral dimensions in which they situated those disagreements. Again, back to the point about Iraq, they had lost the moral credibility to do so. So that shows their tone deafness. Yeah. But it also just shows their lack of humility. And I do think that they were unnecessarily antagonistic. And the example of Donald Trump and the threat that he represents, putting aside all the ways in which I think he's unfit to hold presidential office. Again, actually, this is such an important conversation. We should just have it. The reason why it's so difficult for lots of people like me to just state what I think is obvious, which is that Donald Trump is unfit for the presidency, is because we've had so many failed leaders hold that office over so many years. So someone's initial reaction is, oh, but so-and-so is better. No, I didn't right. say that. Yeah. 
I didn't say yeah. that. What I would say is that he is actually paradigmatic of the problem. The fact that this man has won public office is indicative of the state of our electoral politics. Such a man should never inhabit the office of the presidency. That's my view. Please don't uh, bury me at the stake, listeners. Anyone out there that loves- Wait, listen, you're, you're okay, because only half the crowd are listening now anyway, so that's okay. Yeah, what'd you say? <laughs> I said only half the audience are listening right. now, so you're it's, okay anyway. I hope not. You know, I've cultivated, no, it's, it's, I've, try, I've Dimitri, tried to actually it's get rid of those people. It, no, it's sad, but it's true, right? It's tough to have these conversations. And it's funny, you know, in the middle of the Trump era, let's call it, I was going to say rain, but that, that would please some and not please others. You know, I had a conversation with some really good friends of mine and, and we were in Las Vegas and we're sitting down talking about it. And on the one hand, I had a couple of you know staunch Republicans, on the other side, a staunch Democrat who knew each other but hadn't met. And then there's me in the middle. And we had a fascinating conversation. It was you know, arguably the only civil disagreement we had, I, I was able to have about Trump during his time in office. It was a very tough thing to talk about with people. And I said, look, I'm a Brit, so I've got no dog in this hunt. I'm just curious. I'm, I'm genuinely curious as to how he got elected, what people think about him. And it was a phenomenally respectful conversation between two people who vehemently disagree with each other, or three people, sorry. And it was great. It was fantastic to listen to that. But the, the only point, interestingly, which I could kind of throw out there and get everybody to agree on was, look, can we agree that Trump may be the worst human being to occupy the White House, but can we unanimously agree that he's the worst president to occupy the White House? And that was the only thing where everybody was prepared to accede to the former and the latter say, okay, he's he's not the worst president we've ever had. If you strip the man away, let's just talk about what he's done and strip away the syntax and the grammar and the appearance and all that stuff. And let's just talk about what he's done as president. It was the only place I could find a disagreement. It's like, if you can strip the man away and just look at the president, I'm not saying he's the best, but he wasn't the worst. Well, that's also a low bar, but here, let, let's yeah. actually talk about that a second. <laughs> let's actually talk about that a second. Because is that based on his character and approach and framework, or is it based on the outcomes of his presidency? Because you could also argue that certain presidents, like Bill Clinton, are largely the product of the environment in which they inhabited the office. There was for really sure. nothing that the guy could do wrong. The conditions sure. were just perfect for anyone to succeed. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think I don't think. I mean, apart from on a personal level, obviously, I don't. I don't think Clinton made too many missteps. You know, and this is for someone that came in when he did. It was, a, as you say, don't step on any banana skins, right? And, you know, there were a couple you could probably point to and, you know, the Balkans perhaps, and there were things you could point to and say, yeah. But overall, he had a hell of a tailwind. But to your point earlier, that was the era in which the relationship between Russia and the United States, I think, was lost. It wasn't the Munich speech in 2007, but I think that was the period in time where the Russian people crossed the chasm. But again, to exactly to your point, right? Clinton came in with such a tailwind. It was very easy for America to say, "We've won. Look how great everything is. Mm -hmm. We've got surplus for God's sake." Right? I mean, they had everything well, going. Remember for them. that Alan Greenspan yeah. was worried that he wouldn't be able to conduct monetary policy because right. the government was going to run a surplus. Right. I mean, it's extraordinary to think, but you're right. America was riding very, very high then, and it was a time for great humility. But it wasn't, you know, and, and it was a time when exceptionalism was celebrated and greatness was celebrated. And, and, it, and you know, it's tough. Humility is a very tough thing, right? It's a very difficult thing to hold. And there are times when it's provoked mightily when you, when you actually do have something to crow about. When you are successful and you are doing well, there's that little voice in your head that wants to celebrate it and wants to do it mm. in front of people. It's difficult enough on a personal level for people to do that. But when you are the leader of a country and you're all about telling people how great things are because that's how you get reelected, you know, you never had it so good, right? Yeah. It doesn't play well with other countries, particularly when it's used comparatively. And I think you're right. I, but I, I just love doing that exercise and put different presidents in, you know, look, put Trump in office when Clinton was. 
I don't know. I mean, there would have been some unbelievable tax cuts at that point, I suspect. There would have been all kinds of things that went on, given what he had to work with. It would have been a completely different outcome. But put Clinton in power now, I suspect there would have been a more diplomatic approach to Putin. Maybe we wouldn't have even got to where we got with him. I don't know. You know, Obama wasn't particularly strong on foreign policy, right? So he wouldn't have been a good guy to have in the White House right now. So you end up with, on the one hand, America and all that we believe it to stand to stand for and all that it has stood for over the years, not just to itself and its citizens, but to the rest of us around the world who've admired it and everything it stood for for such a long mm. time. You know, I know I put myself firmly in that category. And then you hand the keys to that finely tuned motor vehicle to a procession of guys and say, you know, take it for a spin for four years and see if you like it. And obviously, they all love driving the car. Some of them have to get out after four years. Some of them find a way to hang on to it for a bit longer. But it becomes about them. And nobody can be, quote unquote, the most powerful human being on earth and not be concerned about their legacy and be concerned when they get to be making decisions about what do I look like if I get this right or wrong? How's history going to judge me? And of course, back in the day, pre-social media, history was written in books and it didn't really matter. But history is five minutes ago now, right? Every press conference, look at Sean Spicer, look at Jim Psaki, and look at all these people that come out and say something. And it is being torn apart on social media live time. Mm. So history happens today. And so how can you possibly not be thinking about your legacy? Because your legacy is happening to you the second you, you know, as you're given the press conference, your legacy is being written. And it's a very difficult position for anybody to be in. You know, and, and I, we're talking about presidents and their time in office. You, know, you look at Joe Biden now, and you know, I, this is not a political observation. It's a human observation. I, I see someone who is unfit for office, and I don't mean that in a mean-spirited way. If that was my grandfather, I just want to give him a hug and get him off that stage. I don't want to see him being subject to what he's being subjected to. And not Democrats will argue, and that's fine. But purely as a human observation, I see a guy I feel sorry for. And I shouldn't be feeling sorry for the leader of the free world. I should be looking at a man who's confident and strong and someone I can feel safe with and someone who I believe is capable of leading the free world through a very troublesome time. And here I am feeling sorry every time I see him on thing. It's just, I don't know, it just doesn't feel good. Yeah, I agree. And actually, I, I want to talk about that a bit more in the second hour of our conversation on the premium feed grant. I'm going to share a few thoughts before I transition us over and so that listeners have some idea of where we're going to go. I think that the real question that sits before America today is, who do we want to be? Because you kind of touched on this early on from my psyche standpoint, and I think that's also important. And all of this speaks to the not just the culture of America, but the unique push-pull mechanisms that are creating that. And you and I had a conversation before we turned on the mic about Jonathan Haidt's recent article in The Atlantic. I had Jonathan on the podcast a couple of years ago to talk about the coddling of the American mind. And I want to talk about his article and his insights around social media. He's so good. But here are a few thoughts that I have. I think that if I were to pick a point at which the unipolar moment began to unwind, manifestly unwind, I should say, would have been between 2006 and 2008, beginning with the midterm elections when the Democrats took control of both houses, mm -hmm. with the announcement of the surge and the, quote, new way forward in Iraq, which was an implicit concession that things hadn't gone the way the administration had promised. And then with the invasion of Georgia by Russia in 2008, those to me were the sort of signposts. And then, of course, the 2008 financial crisis had its own impact in a sort of different way. I don't think that that itself had to impact the unipolar moment because it affected so many things. I think it's interesting also to think about 
what the roles of different presidents have been after Bush and how they interpreted their role. Because again, I think Bush during his entire presidency saw the unipolar moment as being something that still was within his grasp, something that it was his role to grow and to turn into the view of American supremacy. I think that Obama was the first president whose job it was to manage American decline. And I think that Donald Trump heralded the end of neoliberalism, the neoliberal order that was instantiated in the presidency of, of both Clinton and Bush, but that we think about, I think, most clearly in the case of Bill Clinton. And now with Biden, I think we've returned to a sort of managed decline, but not necessarily in a pejorative sense and not in a sense that tries to maintain the contours of the neoliberal order. I think that what Biden and the Biden administration is beginning to sketch out, and I, I think this is most clearly articulated in a speech that he gave shortly after the invasion of Ukraine, where he talked about this being a, I don't think he used the word multi-generational struggle, but he defined it in very much those terms and that this was going to be a long struggle for Western countries to define who they are, what matters to them, et cetera. And I think that's sort of the defining logic of this administration. And it will be interesting to see how they run their re-election campaign, what the issues are around which they want to define that campaign, how Trump and the Trump campaign puts forward their vision, what their vision is intended to be. And then it's I think it's our job as the public to grapple with these questions and ask ourselves, who do we want to be? And what is the challenge for America in this new century, given all the things that we've seen and many of the insults that we've borne? And that's what I really want to ask you about coming out the other end of this conversation, Grant. Well, let me, let me, just, let me just ask you. It's interesting you say that because you're right. We, we've got elections coming up when Americans have to think about who do we want America to be. But the problem is that those elections are coming at a time where the same way domestic politics always trumps foreign politics, individual position always trumps the vision of the nation. So what you're asking Americans to decide what they want America to be at a time when what they're thinking about is, who do I vote for that's going to give me the best shot at putting food on the table and gas in my car and a roof over my head? I don't think people are going to be thinking at all about who do I want America to be. It's help. Interesting. Let, well, that's what we're going to talk about because I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't think they are. And that's what I want to talk about on the other side of this break, Grant. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Grant, as well as the episode transcripts and intelligence reports, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library, where you can also become a premium subscriber today. Grant, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.